The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. Thank you for this great opportunity. So I have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to kind of speed through it as best as I can, okay? Uh, and we're going to harken back to kind of first principles. I know it may have been a little bit of time since, you know, physiology lab and whatnot, but I think it's good to kind of understand how limb loss potentially affects the body um, kind of permanently thereafter. So things to be aware of as they do affect our kind of clinical practice and decision making. Okay, so just going to kind of launch right into it. So I have no disclosures. Uh, so I should say, multiple roads lead to limb loss, right? So it can affect the entire, entire uh, lifespan, right? Anything from congenital limb difference or absence, which can be syndromic or idiopathic, trauma throughout life, you know, end stage sequelae from medical comorbidities, obviously, you know, diabetes, neuropathies, hematologic, rheumatologic, vasculopathy. So cancer, burns, kind of ex environmental exposures in a sense, and, and infections, whether they're, you know, from without the body, from outside, or from within kind of systemic dissemination. So we have an extremely heterogeneous patient population, right? With extremely diverse abilities and needs, which are also constantly evolving, right? As their comorbidities precipitate different sort of impairments, right? And so between this and this and this, a lot of life happens, right? And we're, we're there to professionally, in a sense, provide services and kind of uh, take care of these people. So, um, scope of the problem, right? So in the United States right now, we have over, it's estimated at least 2.3 million people living with limb loss, and that's major limb loss, meaning not just fingers or toes. So the annual incident rate, in a sense, is uh, around 190,000 amputations that happen in the U.S. every year, with nine, 90, close to 90%, and 90,000 of those happen from trauma. So what I would want you to sort of remember and understand, right? Where we're gonna we're gonna shelf some of these things, um, keep them, kind of uh, stir them up into consciousness, kind of keep some bulleted points, kind of as we talk along, in a sense, to contextualize them better. So, up to fifty-five percent of people with diabetes and lower limb loss will require an amputation of the contralateral lower limb within two to three years, and half of those with amputation due to vascular disease will die within five years. So purpose of the talk today is to actually kind of drill down and see what if we can get to the bottom of why some of these things may be happening. What I do professionally in a sense in our health system, you know, um, I do the evaluation for people's prosthetic candidacy after they, they have acquired limb loss for instance, or congenital limb loss and their longitudinal enablement, which means I see them several times in the year taking stock of everything that's in the black here, right? So their level of limb loss, the type of surgery, which does affect the prosthetic outcome, their weight, their size as a passenger on that device or as a, as a user of an upper limb. Cognitive status is extremely important. These things are not as simple, you know, as you put on a glove or you put on a, a shoe and just go. So impairments, as they may have been precipitated by their comorbidities, right, and cumulatively throughout their lives, whether they're neurological burden, in a sense, musculoskeletal impairments, cardiovascular, pulmonary, vascular, so medications that they're taking, how those affect, let's say, are scuttling, let's say, their walking function and level of alertness and whatnot, you know, fall risk, et cetera, and how they may be hampering their physiologic reserve and response, right? So psychometric considerations, biomechanics, energetics, that's, that's, that's to begin with, right? Like before we even look at something like the device itself, that how well is their socket fitting? Is it staying on? Is the device calibrated appropriately and where, do people find themselves and, you know, are they actually optimized to self-actualize in those environments and perform well? So what I do is, in a sense, we work on prosthetic enablement, you know, big lofty term, what does that mean? Working backwards, safe, meaningful and safe device utilization, which means you need to optimize your user, you know, your patient, you need to optimize the device, working backwards, proper surgery, proper revision surgery, if and when needed, Co-management of care, right? Interdisciplinary coordination of care for psychological kind of conditions, comorbidity, the medical comorbidities, behavioral aspects of their overall medical fitness, and again, making sure that the device is optimized for them, and then work hardening accommodations, transportations, and this is constantly reevaluated by the entire kind of health team. So, things that are extremely important to know, um, we're going to call this the pump and bellow story, right? So heart and lungs. 
So it's extremely important to appreciate how acquired limb loss can actually affect the physiologic response and reserve in the body. There was a, an extremely important study back in 94 by Kuri Bailov, like in the Soviet Union. And um, so considering basically a cohort of 230 Russian soldiers, these are young men, you know, 20 to 40 years old who have no other medical problems, right? So there's no other prior history of cardiovascular or pulmonary disease. But the only thing that's happened is they've lost a limb in the war. These folks are at least four months into their since their amputation, and they're being compared to 30 of their typically able body uh, buddies. Okay, so let's see. So these are 52 transtibial, 56 transfemoral, and 39 who have a transfemoral on one side for, in terms of lower limb and plus loss of uh, some some measure of the contralateral lower limb. And they're considered jointly in the evaluation. There's 49 unilateral shoulder disarticulation and 34 bilateral. And we're gonna study the cardiorespiratory status and exercise capacity of these individuals because it's really quite telling. If we do this with our ergometer testing, right? So obviously our lower limb amputees are gonna use a hand, a hand cycle, our, our upper limb amputees are, are gonna use basically a stationary bike. And these people are gonna be challenged right at 20% of their predicted VO2 max, 35, 50, and 75. It's a graded you know, loading protocol. I'm gonna orient you to some of these slides. So these are, this, uh, these are the typically able-bodied folks, okay? So with, you know, uh, at rest, pretty much normal tensive. This is the control group, typically able-bodied. With 20% of VO2 max, yeah, blood pressure goes up. This is normal exercise physiology. We know this is what's gonna happen. So at 35, 50, 75, blood pressure goes up. Three, three minutes after discontinuing the exercise, six minutes and 10 minutes, blood pressure comes back down. So when we look at the, what happens in lower limb amputees, the case of the transtibial, in a sense, um, pretty much the same pattern. However, transfemoral and transfemoral plus, something on the other side, even at rest, people tend to have a higher blood pressure. And with each level of loading, again, there's a consistently statistically noted difference, right? That reaches the level of statistical significance in any case. And we'll get back to why some of this may be. One of the most important things, you know, I really want you to sort of kind of remember the slide. One, looking at the cardiac output, right? Look, let's look at heart function, okay? In the typically able-bodied condition, so the way to sort of understand the slide, and I'm hoping people can see kind of the pointer uh, on the slide. So from the rest condition, let's say your heart rate is 50. If your heart rate goes to 100, that's a 100% increase, okay? So this is a delta from the rest condition at 20% loading, 35% loading, 50, 75, three minutes of rest, six minutes of rest, 10 minutes of rest. And what we have is the cardiac output as it responds to the exercise, and this is normal, this is a typically able body condition, as a dot product of the heart rate and the stroke volume, okay? So let's see what happens. So this is transtibial. This is transfemoral. This is transfemoral plus. And I know everybody's muted, but I'm hoping that there's some gasps, okay? So something that should be readily apparent here, right? Um, this is what's important. You can say that you, we expect cardiac output to be proportional to lean body mass. So there's less body to serve. The cardiac output, we don't so much care that it's lower, okay? There's less body to serve. However, look at what's happening with the stroke volume. So even in a transtibial amputee with sub-maximal exercise, 75% of predicted VO2 max, there is a dip in the stroke volume. If this had just been proportional body size loss in a sense, everything, the, the fundamental relationship of the stroke volume still being able to elevate should have been maintained. Everything should have been pointing up and kind of coming back down in unison. However, we're seeing that with lower limb loss, right, People need to kind of flog their heart a little bit faster. The heart rate goes up. And the more you challenge people with activity, you know, they're almost overtly reliant. The more proximal the limb loss, they're overtly reliant on escalating the heart rate to maintain their cardiac output. And something definitely happens to the pumping function of the heart, right? Something happens to stop the, um, the stroke volume. And this is what the authors actually concluded, that there's a in all subjects with lower limb loss, even at submaximal exercise loading, there's a depression of the pumping function of the heart. And this effect is more pronounced with the more proximal necessitation. One of the most important, uh, I feel like, figures in medicine, okay? Um, uh, we, you know, 
extremely important to take stock of. This tells us that something's wrong. It doesn't tell us exactly what's wrong. So let's talk about what's actually happening and what the evidence sort of bears out. So this is our regular kind of pressure volume curve, uh, typical cardiac physiology. In the rest condition, this is the heart pumping, you know, basically in a counterclockwise fashion at rest. We're filling up to our end diastolic volume, you know, emptying out you know, to, into an end systolic volume. So with exercise, right, there's preload increases. There's more blood that returns to the heart, right? So with exercise, any physiologic challenge in, in any case, there's increased end diastolic volume, heart fills up more, it has a more forceful effective squeeze, right? And we end up with less blood in the heart at the end of systole than we do from the rest condition. And that increase accounts for the, the, the increase in the stroke volume, okay. So when we look at this experimentally, right? So in the typically able-bodied condition, this is exactly what we see. Compared to the rest condition, at 20% loading, 35, 50, 75, there's an increased preload, increased filling, a more effective forceful squeeze, forceful squeeze, and then we end up with a little bit less blood in the heart than, than even the, the rest condition. So, so this is normal. So this is what happens in, let's say, transtibial, transfemoral, transfemoral plus. And you should actually note that, look at what's happening to the filling, even with somebody with a transtibial amputation, right? So when they go up to like 7.5 mets, right? Metabolic equivalents, you know, it's shoveling snow, so to speak, you know, level of kind of exertion. There's actually a depression in the preload, right? And for people with more proximal limb loss, you can see that quite literally, the heart is straining to actually fill up between beats, okay? This is extremely important. So, these are considered companion pieces, right? One tells you if there's something wrong with the function, you know, the, the pumping function of the heart, and the second image, in a sense, kind of reveals that it's actually the preload that's implicated. So to understand this a little bit better, we need to kind of look at our comparative uh, kind of uh, physiology. So quadrupeds are pretty smart, right? So they figured out that they have 70% of blood at or above the level of the heart, so they just need to zip it across. This is metabolically extremely sort of efficient, right? However, we have 70% of our blood volume at or below the level of our heart, right? And blood is heavy. So what ends up happening, right, for us, in order to create, we need to create a pressure gradient, right? We need to drive a pressure gradient to return blood back up to the heart and make it available for the next pumping cycle, right? And for activity. This pretty much means, you know, we're overtly reliant on the muscle action of, our, of both lower limbs and the trunk. So once we start taking a limb, you know, basically transtibular, even more proximally, you decrease the vascular space. So you actually, you contract the, the, the vascular space, but at the same time, and more importantly, you know, uh, the dissociation there is you actually decrease, you lose your mechanism to create a pressure gradient to be able to more effectively, you know, bring uh, uh, kind of uh, fortify your preload, you know, bring the blood back up to the heart and make it available for activity. So, and obviously, right, so thermal acclimation, you know, like thermal effects are extremely important. So, so for some of our patients, by the way, the strain on the heart, right, um, if they're challenging themselves with activity, something stressful is happening to the body, they're going to increase their heart rate uh, a lot. He can, and the preload is kind of scuttled, and you can get into sort of wonky heart rhythms, right? Arrhythmias, dysrhythmias, right? So what's happening in the heat, for instance, right? So who's safe enough to go in a sauna, right? So who's safe enough to be on a roller coaster, right? These are extremely important things. Okay, when you look at the equivalent, when you look at the pulmonary function aspect, right? So these, these are equivalent, right, in, in showing the typically able body condition, transtable, transfermal, transfermal plus, and we're looking at the minute ventilation volume as a, as a product of the, uh, the vital capacity and the respiratory rate. And in lower limb amputees, you'll see that, hey, the respiratory rate maintains in terms of the drive. You know, the vital capacities maintain at least in these conditions with very proximal lower limb loss on both sides. You know, when we have, for instance, bilateral transfemoral, even the breathing function can actually ultimately be affected. And this, this may actually uh, stem from the fact that the, the actual vascular volume is quite collapsed. So even your capacity to do air exchange uh, you may have some parenchymal changes to intrinsically in the sense to the lungs. Okay, 
So for lower limb loss, the cardiac capacity in particular is the main limiting factor, reducing work capacity, right? So homeostatic changes and central hemodynamics can and do influence the respiratory system. So we have body mass reduction, right? Vascular compartment reduction, blood flow volume reduction, reduction in contractile myocardium capacity, which is interesting because if you decrease the preload, um, basically, you know, the Frank Starling curve in a sense, well, the pump in line, the pump in line basically remodels. It gets short, it gets smaller and stiffer. And then when you ask more of it, you challenge it with activity, the only trick you have up, you know, up your sleeve in a sense is to just try to go faster. Okay, so we end up also having a result in pulmonary and ventilation and respiratory capacity decline. So VO2 max can actually be seen to, to, to decrease, right? All right, in terms of upper limb loss, when we look at the hemodynamics for people who have had a very proximal upper limb loss, hemodynamics are not affected. However, right, pulmonary function is quite, you know, quite affected. So compared to their typically able body controls, so unilateral shoulder disarticulation and bilateral shoulder disarticulation, right, you see the, so inspiratory capacity down by like, almost like a fifth, right, or a quarter, but in, almost like to a third here. Minute ventilation volume, vital capacity, total lung capacity, ins uh, inspiratory and expiratory reserve volumes are decreased and pretty significantly, right? So, and also you lose the capacity, you know, once you're challenged with activity to increase, you know, your inspiratory capacity and, and, the ad and you don't demonstrate an adequate increase of maximal ventilation. So which of these lung volumes are actually affected? All of them, okay. These are important things to know because, so for instance, you know, um, very proximal upper limb loss, as we'll see, right? So anatomic, dynamic, and biomechanical disturbances and dystrophic processes associated with the shoulder, girdle, and thorax can and do occur after very proximal upper limb loss. So you end up having atrophy of the muscles that used to go from the thorax, in a sense, from the trunk, in a sense, to the humerus. So the more proximal the amputation, the greater extended impact of degenerative and dystrophic processes. And these, at, at the shoulder disarticulation or four-quarter amputation, the muscles that influence respiration uh, lose their fixation points. So they tack down and you don't, you're not able to, you know, basically um, expand your thoracic cage as efficiently. So that can actually slap down your pulmonary function testing, right? You can give you a permanent restricted pattern, right? That can affect almost like a quarter to a third of the, your breathing capacity. So the, the sum total of anatomic and biomechanical disturbances and dystrophic processes are responsible for thorax mobility decline and lack of mobility increase with activities. Okay. So compromised hemodynamics and reduced tolerance to exercise loading is considered to reduce work capacity. And there's a direct relationship to how much of the limb in a sense is lost. So if you were to take a typically able-bodied person, again, do some ergometer testing, you know, at a comfortable 42 milliliters per kilogram per minute of oxygen, you know, they may be able to crank out 2.8 watts per kilogram per minute, right? So for somebody who has a unilateral amputation, uh, that drops down to 1.7, bilateral drops down to one. So this is a significant reduction, right, in work capacity, right, in physiologic reserve. In, so for what does this mean in terms of how, how much should we be challenging folks even through their rehab and, you know, and activities, even educating them about what, what's, a, what's an appropriate level of sort of activity to maintain. So for unilateral transfemoral transtibular shoulder disarticulation, people should probably be staying well within their 40 to 60% of their VO2 max. For bilateral, this drops down significantly low, right? So you understand the work capacity, there's a ceiling effect there, right? For, from, from a safety margin standpoint. Is there any point to exercising? Well, uh, some of these folks went back for a two month training protocol, right? And then they re-examined their hemodynamics, right? So, there's, you know, a small decrease in the maximal heart rate that's attained. There's a, there's a small increase in the stroke volume. There's a small increase in the cardiac output. However, overall work capacity is, you know, is, is very minimally affected, right? And their VO2 max. We have, um, so there's a permanent change, right? That, that actually happens. So let's think about the typically able-bodied condition again, right? So somebody, at rest, let's say, uh, typically able body, five liters per minute in terms of cardiac output, with activity, our reserve, right, to ramp up, 
our cardiac function into our heart rate reserve and everything, basically we can increase that to 15 to 20 liters per minute, right? In setting vigorous exercise. If you were to uh, commit yourself to sort of, you know, uh, the, improving your fitness, right? You can only bump that up just a modest, like in the 10 to 20%. That's about it. By comparison, just, uh, just understand, world-class athletes achieve maximal rates of pro approaching 40 liters per minute, right? And they, you know, and they're, they're, it's a, they're a different beast, right? They're, it's a quantum state apart. And the incongruity is probably due to genetically determined greater than normal heart size, along with intensive long-term training undertaken by exceptionally able competitors. So cardiac output varies with approximate proportion to lean body mass, and it tends to decline after your 20s. Putting it all that together, effectively, you know, everybody on the, on, on the red curve here is kind of living La Vida Netflix, right? So untrained, you know, so, and if you go to the gym, commit yourself to a process, maybe you bump up to this blue, uh, this blue curve. However, it's still, you know, people, most people are never going to be able to reach this kind of confluence, genetic confluence and training in a sense that sets world-class athletes apart. The reason I'm mentioning all this is to basically say after limb loss, right, and especially, let's say, lower limb loss, you're kind of slapped down to, a, to another curve, to another line here, right? So you drop down and try as you might, you never go back up to your own potential able-bodied maximum, right? So that's, this is extremely sort of important to understand. This is a keen in medicine to, let's say, somebody's pulmonary function testing, right, throughout life if they've been smoking. So if this is our, you know, lung, uh, lung function test, FEV1, you know, at 25 years of age, there's an expected age-dependent decline that's going to happen slowly over time, leaving you, you know, well after 75 with a, a fair amount of reserve, right? Like this is, you know, this is pretty good breathing capacity to have. If you've been smoking, obviously you ratchet down. And even if you quit smoking, right, you never go back up to an age matched, in a sense, uh, non-smoker. So it just continue the same rate, sort of rate of decline. So the same sort of thing happens. So this is the sequelae of the surgery. Basically, you know, if this is our, back to our pressure volume curve, right? If we go from the rest condition, in a sense, you know, to the exercise condition or challenge, con physiologically challenged condition, if this is the, the capacity we would have had, right, the, the sequelae of the surgery are, you know, with, a, with decreased preload and hypokinesis, right, like people end up with a smaller, stiffer heart. When they are challenged, in a sense, you know, uh, you know, the, the preload is scuttled, you know, they, they may end up needing to kind of squeeze more blood out of the heart. But please don't forget, we also have the meds on board, right? So, so many, we've been looking at these effects and they're can't miss effects, they're big effects in people who haven't had any cardiac problems, right? That's not our typical patient. Our typical patient is coming in, maybe this vascular, they've had like, you know, so the same critical limb ischemia process that may have cost them, you know, uh, inflow to a limb, you know, and it's happening the body over, you, you know, coronary artery disease, their status post stents, four vessel cabbage, et cetera pretty diseased heart in a sense, right? So this, this is still very much in play. And the medications that are on board, right, the anotropics, you know, we put, you know, beta blockers, for instance, right? They're gonna slap down, right? They're gonna, they're gonna put another ceiling effect to how much people can dip into their heart rate reserve, which causes hypoperfusion, right? So it slaps down somebody's capacity even more. So, and this can cause, you know, hyperperfusion for many organ systems, the brain, the kidneys, et cetera, but also scuttle their ability to actually, you know, go room to room. So I had a one, one patient and she was transtibial and a former nurse and she was, uh, I was explaining this whole story to her. She was feeling very morose, you know, not, not being able to kind of throttle up her level of activity and she was on a beta blocker and I said, hey, Let's, let's see about potentially decreasing your beta blocker. And we have to, right? So she spoke to her primary care physician. They have to, it comes back six months later and says, I have so much energy now. I can go, I, I can go about my day, for instance. So th these are the medication aspects extremely important for the effects to an altered physiological state. Okay, so motor capabilities in persons with amputations, right? Can extend, uh, I mean, depend to a large extent on the dynamic capabilities of cardiac and respiratory systems. Am I saying people shouldn't exercise? Not at all. So what do we make of these folks, right? Well, I would contest that these are the same folks, by the way, who had they been typically able-bodied, they would have kicked everybody's butt anyway, right? Like they would have been world-level athletes, right? And even after their limb loss, there's enough of a reserve 
that you know, uh, at, in earlier parts of their life, they can mean, attain and maintain high levels of athletic performance. But that's not everyone, right? I know we love to have the, the poster, you know, the children in a sense, you know, that to say, ah, this is all what you can achieve. But this is not necessarily either advisable or feasible for everyone, right? Okay. So uh, I know when we talk about cardiac function, it's good to sort of bring it back down to earth regarding um, kind of metabolic equivalence, right? So we're sitting at rest. That's one metabolic equivalent. We're walking, you know, at a self-select pace, you know, that might be two, two metabolic equivalents. Shoveling snow, seven and a half, for instance. So what's the reserve there to do safely, right? So if we look at, you know, five activities less than five minutes, who can safely do them? Which, again, less than 50% of your VO2 max, roughly. So typically able body condition, yeah. Walking's, you know, there's more than adequate reserve, right? So within the green region, can you, everything and anything within the green region you can do, and it's not even effortful, right? Well, you're, when you're transtibial, you know, in a sense, to go up to your five minutes, in a sense, yeah, you're actually flogging your heart a little bit more, right? But you still have reserve. Here's the reserve for transfemoral and then for transfemoral plus, right? So there is an upper limit to what's advisable for people to do. It's a lot of education. Also, the medications we put on top of this, right? So this is, again, in people without any cardiac or pulmonary problems, right? So imagine people who have a diseased heart or have a bunch of medications on board. So this, this, this is actually far more depressed, you know, in, 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 in most of our patients, I would, I would say. So the typical textbooks would say, hey, uh, try to preserve as much limb as possible. Then, uh, and the reason for that, in a sense, is if somebody loses a limb, you know, through the ankle, energy to walk, in a sense, traverse the environment goes up 15%. Transtibial level, 25 to 33%. Bilateral transtibial, 50% unilateral transfemoral, 75%. And then you see how this gradient uh, kind of generating mechanism is important. Hip disarticulation, 110 to 200% increase in the energy demanded to sort of walk. That's if you're young and traumatic. If you're elderly, dysvascular, diabetic, add another 25 to 40% on top of that. So the difficulty with this is, yep, people are having their amputations as a life sparing measure, obviously. And they come and, you know, somebody will come and see me and say, hey, um, you know, I'm I'm here for my prosthetic fitting, and it's like, well, they have a pretty diseased heart in a sense. You know, we're going to prop them up on a prosthetic device that's going to obligate their heart to work twice as hard as it, as it, you know, as it has in recent years, and it's actually a pretty diseased heart. So, you know, we, we try to talk about and negotiate expectations, what, what's safe to do, and how to throttle up safely, right, with appropriate medication kind of redosing and management. So. Like I said, these are can't miss effects, right? So even in the highest uh, functioning, let's say transfemoral uh, uh, patients, you know, we consistently will see compared to the typically able body condition. So transfemorals will have higher metabolic rate, higher metabolic cost, higher heart rate, higher uh, rating of perceived exertion at all speeds of walking. And if you actually see the, the self-selected walking speed, right? Uh, for somebody who's typically able bodied, you know, and somebody who's transfemoral, you can see that. Yeah, fair enough. I'll bring it back. So people are basically tachycardic, right? Even at their self-selected walking speed, kind of going even room to room. All right. Extremely important. So, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely important to understand that um, the, the cardiac kind of adaptations afterwards, they can put you in a pretty precarious state. So who's at risk? Who, what's happening? What should we be advising? How are we minding and kind of uh, people's care and making decisions and educating? So there was a study by, by Mundell et al. back in uh, 2018. And they looked at uh, individuals with uh, dysvascular, uh, so vasculopathy leading to, let's say, transfemoral amputation. And they have a four, time, uh, four times increased risk for a cardiac event, right, with a hazard ratio of like 3.78, right? They also have an increased risk for non-cardiac mortality, right? Which is like six times higher. Those with transfemoral amputation due to trauma or cancer have the same hazard ratio relative to typically able-bodied controls, right? This is important to sort of understand. And maybe in the dysvascular case, right? Like we have all these other comorbidities. We have the polypharmacy on board. We also have this altered state and the hypokinesis. Maybe that's a recipe for disaster, right? Because you see that the limb loss itself, yeah, it kind of decreases your physiologic reserve, right? And kind of puts a ceiling, puts a damper in a sense and a ceiling on how much you can do safely. But 
it doesn't in and of itself create, you know, basically, a, you know, precipitate heart attacks, for instance, right? But in people who have vasculopathy, it, it definitely can. The other thing that's telling is for those who get their prosthesis, right? There's no difference in the risk for cardiac events for those with or without the prosthesis. So just being having the prosthetic fitting and ambulating, let's say, with the prosthesis does not confer a protective effect. So there's something else that's kind of going on. And again, is, is it comorbidities? Is it medications? It's not quite clear. Again, let's remember that people with unilateral lower limb loss, right, are going to have a 20 20% risk of becoming bilateral amputees. So you see how this exacerbates, right? So the moment, you know, it's one, it's one thing to compromise one side, but you understand how the cardiovascular changes that are taking place when the contralateral limb is now, you know, or we're having a revision to a more proximal level, and now the contralateral limb is also sort of imperiled and amputated. So the three-year survival, right, may only be 25 to 50% compared to those with peripheral vascular disease alone. How do we evaluate, right? So even, even for, uh, you know, who's cleared for surgery, for instance, right? You know, the, and even afterwards, who, who can get their prosthesis? What ought to be happening, when this is not done nationwide, it's done differently in different countries even, you know, in different places here. So clinical history is fairly unreliable. So going for by symptoms and asking somebody, it's a self-limiting process if you think about it, like a lot of, you know, vasculopathy, whereby, you know, if you ask people, do you have any chest pain or, you know, uh, any chest pain? No. Well, of course not. You've been sitting it out, right? For, you, know, you, you haven't been behaviorally challenging yourself. You've throttled down behaviorally. So you haven't really put yourself, you know, uh, challenged yourself with activities that would unmask you know, if there is uh, the state in the sense of the heart. So when you look at resting EKG in people who have had an amputation, it's not all that telling. People with peripheral vascular disease, still 50% of them will have findings even at rest. But if you stress test them, right? You, it will uncover like another third, like, uh, you, you, like, like two thirds or up to 85, 84% uh, actually will exhibit arrhythmias, dysrhythmias, right? So this is in, extremely important to sort of understand. Um, so we need to be proactive about cardiac clearance for prosthetic candidacy and cardiac rehab for, for select patient subpopulations. And I would, I would say that's the majority of our patients who have a prior, a premorbid innocence cardiac history. Okay. In terms of the blood pressure, again, um, I find I speak with a lot of people who do the primary care in a sense for blood pressure management, internist, uh, um, uh, family physicians, cardiologists, you know, and sometimes they, we need to sort of understand what's in play here. Like I said, uh, a lot of people with very proximal lower limb loss will run a little bit hotter, right? They, they'll, their blood pressure will be higher. And we need to sort of understand this. So even if you think about somebody who comes to the doctor's office, sits in the reception desk, and, you know, well, we we challenge them with activity, right? They stand up, they walk back, right? Uh, they sit down, we check their blood pressure. Well, their blood pressure is not going to come back down to normal for a good 15 to 20 minutes. So we see post-challenge an elevated, you know, uh, heart rate, you know, heart rate, we, we will also see some elevated blood pressure. And the question is like, okay, how, how aggressive do you want to be? Do you, do you say, oh, your blood pressure is still high. Let's throw on a fifth agent, right? So, um, I, you know, if, if this was a, if, if we were doing this live, I would ask somebody to venture a guess as to what the blood pressure is. You know, if you if you maintain a you know deep seated squat for a good thirty seconds, right? And by way of calibration, because people, what people think a high blood pressure is, you know, like people venture guesses into one sixties, one eighties, and it's like, well, let just understand that with a forty percent mus, you know, uh, muscle voluntary contraction of just hand grip, right? Just hand grip, right? If you hold it for like 60 seconds, you're already at 140, right? If you hold it for 120 seconds, two minutes in, you're at 160, right? So what if you're doing a body-wide squat, right? What, 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 what's the range here? And quite frankly, like, you know, in this instance, 360 over 320 would be fairly typical, right? And this is if you're checking with a, you know, pressure transducer, right? Like a, with an A-line. So uh, we, we've known for a long time, so arterial blood pressure response to heavy resistance exercise, this is normal to be happening neck on down. So the greatest peak pressure is double leg press, for instance, 320 over 250, you know, uh, in one subject, 480 over 350, and that's normal. Neck on down, the body experiences a really wide pulse pressure difference, you know, throughout the day. So, and if you see basically people doing their double leg press, this is the, let's say the eccentric and concentric and eccentric phases of the exercise. You know, the mean arterial pressure keeps on rising, heart rate also rises, 
And if you see activities like people being normal tense about rest with one arm curled, right? This is a one single dumbbell, right? Like your pressures are pretty high. It's just not all out what sort of kind of appreciate it. So we do have the auto-regulatory mechanisms in the neck. We want central perfusion pressure to stay in a sweet spot, obviously. At some point, be it atherosclerosis, be it long-standing pressure in the tank, even at rest, these mechanisms relent and you know, people stroke out or you know, have other sort of uh, pop aneurysms and whatnot. But uh, I, would, I would say this is pretty normative, right? And it's good to sort of remember that even when we're evaluating blood pressure and making, uh, taking stock of somebody's range understanding how it relates to their level of conditioning, any, any dysautonomia that may be in play, right? So it's also uh, in our MQTs in a sense, it's also uh, a question of the hypokinesis and so rarefaction is extremely important to sort of understand. And in vascular physiology, right, that's the process that results in a reduction in the density of capillaries in a tissue. So think about it this way. If you're not using your muscles, right, you decrease capillary density in them. If demand, right, okay, so conversely, if you have a state where blood flow exceeds demand for periods of several days or more, microvascular vessels degenerate, reducing vascular density and increasing resistance. So, um, and we'll see why this is important, right? So, this is your blood flow at rest. This is distribution in the body of the blood flow, you know, uh, the body over. And this is when you exercise. So if you're just languishing, basically in a rested state, you never exercise, right? So as far as your organs are concerned, you know, the in blood flow, times are plenty, right? They have more demand, more, more supply than demand. You can, you decrease capillary density in all of your organs. There's disuse, because of the disuse of the muscle side, you decrease, you know, uh, the capillary density there, and you end up with systemically lower total cross-sectional surface area, and higher pressures in the tank. So we are meant to bob from this condition to this condition, right? They have the steel effect, so to speak, to, to keep both our muscles in, with good capillary density and our organs on their toes, again, with healthy capillary density, right? So when we say sitting is the new smoking, this is kind of like what we mean, right? So we do need to, to, to be cognizant of like, um, again, how important the, the overall medical physical conditioning is for blood pressure management and cardiovascular health, right? I'm going to switch gears just a little bit because I want, you know, we're going to cover a lot of things, but they're all inter-influencing, right? So what do little people and really big people in medicine have in common? And the thing that should come to mind is, you know, they have specialized pharmacologic considerations, right? So let's talk about medication really, really briefly. So propofol. So there's a case that it was uh, kind of reported out of Japan where they had a gentleman who had bilateral transfemoral amputations, right? So his weight is 57 kilograms, right? So he needs a surgery for an unrelated reason. And so they dosed the propofol for 57 kilograms, right? And he remained aware during propofol anesthesia, right? So in a patient with amputated legs, right? The original size of the visceral organs. So propofol is gonna to go to the liver, right? For a first pass in a sense, you know, a certain amount of it is gonna be like deactivated, right? So, at, uh, so your liver is still intact. It still has its full size and its full allele complement there. So it's going, to, it's going to chop down medication at a set rate, right? It doesn't know or care that the legs are gone. So if you're dosing it, right, you want to dose it to what the typical able-bodied size in a sense would have been, right, for that estimation. So when we're using, when we're dosing medications that have a hepatic first pass clearance, you really want to go by the typically able-bodied weight, the theoretical, what it was in a sense before the amputation. That's extremely important. Another difficulty we have with um, dosing uh, people after amputation, right, is the fact that you can no longer, you really shouldn't be relying on serum creatinine, right? Because if you think about it, you've lost, the more proximal the limb loss, you've lost a, a compartment of the body that's mainly muscle. So there's, there's an actual a relative, both an actual and a relative decrease, right, to the circulating serum creatinine. So it looks like your kidneys are doing better than they actually are, right? So creatinine-based estimators of uh, GFR, right, overestimate renal function in the setting of amputation. And people are proposing that if we want to see, we want to renally dose meds or know how people's kidney function is doing following a, a amputation, you really be, should be looking at different markers. So 
So if you see here the serum creatinine in all amputees, whether it's a small, let's say uh, a distal amputation, mid-level, a very proximal, you can see that you can misestimate pretty significantly, right? Like uh, and drop a, like, you know, basically like a quarter here. So things like um, uh, serum cysteine C, beta trace protein, beta two microglobulin seem to be, you know, better biomarkers in a sense to track either singly or in combination to estimate renal function. And we're kind of hoping this would start being the norm for people who, who are status post amputation. And you also have those medications like chemotherapeutics, right? That you would actually need to be, again, you, because you're gonna misestimate the renal dosing, you probably be, wanna be doing therapeutic drug monitoring, right? To make sure that you're you know, not in a toxic sort of threshold. Okay, so the reminder there being, you really need to consider, right? After major limb loss from the body, major mass loss or limb loss from the body in a sense, uh, you need to consider changes in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Our constitutional, uh, our institutional experience here, right? So when we looked at, this is data that we've actually submitted for publication, 216 cases of very proximal limb loss, so transfemoral hemo, uh, uh, hip, hip disarticulation, hip hemipelvectomy, uh, so hemipelvectomy or four-quarter amputation, right? So we looked at the medications that people were taking, you know, pre-op, below the axis, post-op, above, and the difference. Right, so we have, uh, in the majority of cases, the post-op medications increase, right? And in, in smaller number, they stay the same or, or decrease. But in 216 cases, you see that the, the meds increase, right? Or stay the same or increase in most of the cases. The pre-op meds are seven before on average, 10 afterwards, right? And in those cases where you have pre-op and post-op meds, the dose remains the same or increases in the majority of the cases, right? And I would say in, in cases where one of the doses was not known either pre or post, uh, basically this would most likely lumps in. So you have over 90% of, you know, uh, of the medications. You have a reduction to body size, right? And nobody's thinking to redose the meds, right? So, and, and each of those agents would probably have different redosing considerations, right? So some to the altered physiologic effect, some to the new body size, some to, again, are they, are they hepatic, you know, and how are the kidneys doing? So it's kind of like unexplored territory right now. And don't forget, I mean, this slide and the next would probably be called, in a sense, you know, more, more drugs, more problems, right? So obviously, the number of potential drug interactions rapidly increases with polypharmacy, right? That's the sort of formula that gets you to those numbers of how many interactions you may have in play. And even for the, the, on the averages, you know, you can have a significant number that's like sort of theoretical ones that you need to watch out for. So when we looked at the drug-drug interactions, you know, through Lexicomp or what may be triggered through our, our kind of um, the ordering systems, you know, we typically get these warnings, right? So A and B, we can disregard, no action needed. So C and D, monitor therapy and consider, ther consider therapy modification. Well, there's a question of like, how useful are these in practice, right? They're kind of as useful as this, right? Warn, consider yourself warned, right? But they don't quite tell you what to do. So what would you do, for instance, if you had somebody on you know, six medications and you saw the following pattern, right? So just monitor therapy, monitor therapy. Well, how about now? How about now? How about now? When are you doing something about it? When are you concerned? How about now, right? How about now? So these interactions, a lot of the times, you, you can have nodes of inner influencing interactions, and that's not necessarily something that kind of elevates to kind of clinical, um, uh, uh, well, it doesn't, I, I guess, uh, the significance of this is not really kind of uh, elevated in, in, in a clinical decision-making manner. So the drug interactions, the other thing we need to understand, they can differ, the, what gets triggered in a the system, they can differ among databases, right? So they're, they're based on software algorithms. So a lot of these are not experimentally verified, but hypothesized, right? So they only consider the active metabolites. So there's no telling what the breakdown products, you know, how they're inner influencing one another. And they also assume unobstructed elimination, right? Which how many of our patients postoperatively, let's say may be constipated, for instance or have urinary retention. So, and there's no weighted complexity matrix to sort of elevate, hey, you have three or four agents that are inner influence and you may wanna do something about this, right? And there's no specialized dosing consideration prompts for people with a status of limb loss, right? So that, that, that hasn't been done, it's not currently in our practices. 
So the C-type warnings, when we looked at them again before and after, right, and here's the difference, we gain a whole bunch of C-type warnings, right, to monitor therapy, D-type warnings to basically consider changing the agent, again, they also increase, right? X-type warnings, avoid combination, you also gain some of these as well in these 216 cases. So kind of a summary, kind of reminder, again, we end up in the majority of the cases with more meds and, a, and an increase in, you know, in, in, uh, in drug, drug, potential drug, drug interactions. And that's not really fully appreciated. So how, what we're clicking people out of the hospital on, advising them to take, that they leave the, you know, our setting of care, they're, we're not, no longer hawkishly mining, they're resuming a lot of their home meds, they're going into a smaller compartment, right? And, you know, side effect, people can dip into a side effect profile and decompensate far more readily, but that's not all that well explored. So we have an abrupt and permanent change of the body size composition compartments, the physiology is altered, there ought to exist redosing considerations, right, uh, uh, specific for amputation status, and we have incompletely mapped the uh, drug-drug interaction landscape, right? So, again, change of the physiologic reserve, alter pharmacokinetics, decreased mobility also, and all of these are inter-influencing, and with polypharmacy on board, there's a, a very likely, you know, decrease in stability and mortality. So, just understand how important this is, right, and how maybe unappreciated some of these considerations are to the, for, the cardio, for the pulmonary, cardiovascular, and pharmacologic considerations. So with a, with a, with a partial foot amputation, you know, transtibial or transfemoral, this is who's alive a month out. So, you know, one in five people with a transfemoral kind of dies. So a year out, right, and then five years out. So pretty significant, again, mortality here. And if you see the, uh, how, how we did, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, and in the early, in, uh, in late 90s, we really haven't put a damp, you know, like, we haven't put a, uh, a dent in this, right? So, and some of these effects, again, may be uh, misattributed to other people, people's other comorbidities, but it, again, we should be looking at maybe uh, the effect, cumulative effect of the polypharmacy, in a sense, in an altered physiological state. That hasn't been teased out at all. Okay, so solutions obviously for our patients, you know, uh, uh, you do want to consult a clinical pharmacist prior to discharge and even for surgical planning, I would say, right? So consider elimination of agents, right? Appropriate redosing for each medication. So cardiac evaluation for people with limb loss uh, for the majority of our patients and cardiac rehab, which they're not really set up to get right now, and coordination with physiatry to promote mobility and medical fitness. So I'm going to try, I'm hoping I have time to kind of, uh, get into our uh, uh, field-specific expertise here. So should you be doing a, an amputation, you know, general versus regional anesthesia? So a nationwide exploratory retrospective cohort study in Japan kind of uh, showed um, that basically there was no difference in the 30-day mortality. This is just for transtibial or partial foot amputation, right? When the peripheral nerve uh, block group had, had a lower risk of post-op delirium. So Kim et al. back in 2019, they did a propensity score matched observational study looking at 171 in, in each basically condition. They found no difference in the 30 or 90 day mortality post-op uh, morbidity and mortality. However, they say if you do um, uh, general anesthesia, right, your post-op ICU admission is higher, intra-op hypotension is higher, they suppress your use uh, uh, throughout the, uh, the acute care stay is, is higher, right? So there's something to be said about who's a candidate for what, right? So taking stock of their pre-morbid conditions, right? And then, you know, there may be cases where you may want to err on the side of kind of regional anesthesia rather than, you know, general. Select cases, you know, but more sort of discuss. Right, phantom limb control pain, extremely important. And we're gonna, and, and again, I'm sure everybody's more kind of familiar and to qualify what's residual limb pain, right? Pain in the remaining part of an amputated limb. Right, which may include even focally induced paresthesias, dysesthesias, positive tenel sign, et cetera. But phantom limb sensations, right? So neuropathic sensations that are non-debilitating. It's creepy, crawly, you know, it's, it's tingling, you know, it's slight burn, et cetera. However, it's not distressing. Phantom limb pain, right, is distressing and functionally debilitating and limiting. 
depending on how people are asked, I think there's a big misestimation of how many people get, you know, phantom limb pain. The, I think the literature overestimates. And they'll say, well, 80% of people have phantom limb pain or 100% of people have phantom limb pain. It's the same thing as back pain, right? Depends how you ask the question. Have you had back pain? Yeah, pretty much 100% prevalence, you know, in a sense throughout our lifetime, right? But, you know, how long, for how long, how debilitating, et cetera, those things are not really parsed out. We're going to take the stratospheric view. So, and I'm going to go from the conclusion first, okay? And then we'll see how the evidence and particular studies and evidence you're aware of kind of where it kind of slots in, right? How it makes sense. So just understand, phantom limb syndrome is a very broadly distributed phenomenon throughout the entire neuraxis, right? That changes dynamically with acute and chronic phases, requiring different interventions at different sites during opportune time frames, right? So it's not like you can just do anything whenever, right? And have a, expect a, a positive effect. So if we think about, because this is where to know to look and uh, research attention has sort of focused. If we look at the, the, the actual transected nerve, right? If we look at the dorsal root uh, ganglion, if we look at the spinal level, the you know, spinal cord and, and the brain, here's what's sort of known. So early events, right? Obviously at the, tran at the transected nerve, we have massive tissue and neuronal injury, hyperexcitability, spontaneous discharges, increased neuronal activity, expansion of neural fields, hyperexcitability, loss of descending inhibitory pathways from the brain, so spreading of non-pain neurons, right? And this also, the loss of the descending inhibitory pain pathways causes increased NMDA receptor activity. And we also have dorsal root ganglion spontaneous discharges, extremely sort of important, right? Complex interplay for transduction, transmission, perception, and modulation, even early on. So in the chronic of events, in a sense, so that deafferentiation that happens, right, causes cortical reorganization. And we'll see a picture of that, you know, an abnormal neural matrix, I'll, I'll explain that really briefly. And limbic plasticity can also lead to pain associated anxiety and depression. Spinal cord sensitization and wind up phenomena are, are seen. The dorsal root ganglion, actually, even in, uh, after acute transection of a peripheral nerve, you can actually, people are now saying this may be, this may be a target on account of. It can actually generate 75% of the ectopic, uh, basically, activation, whereas the neuroma and neuroma, if they are, you know, is responsible for 25%, right? So there seems to be something that's happening at the level of the dorsal root ganglion, kind of those sort of uh, bidirectional sensory uh, cell bodies. So what do, we talk, what do we mean when we say cortical sort of remapping, right? So the deafferentiation, you know, information is not coming in. So in our, both our motor strip and our sensory strip, so the fact that there's no longer input, right? You can have, um, that's prime real estate, neural from neural tissue standpoint. So neighboring areas will actually encroach and take over. They need that basically uh, for processing. So subjectively, somebody will be describing a telescoping phenomenon, an altered sense of perception of where the amputate, the phantom limb is, right? And what configuration it is. Things to understand, like what is, what is the place of things like mirror therapy in, in all of this? You know, we seem to prioritize, we have our proprioception, you know, we can point to our you know, fingers and know where they are in space, but vision is extremely important in correcting that assumption, right? So, um, so if I give somebody a plastic hand, for instance, a plastic right hand, you know, and I'm stroking their right hand and the plastic hand, I can trick the brain into readily accepting the plastic hand. And if I try to whack it with a, with a hammer, people will flinch even if the, if the plastic limb seems imperiled, right? So we have this dynamic ever in flux remapping based, so when we prioritize visual, visual information for proprioception as well. So this is the place of why um, following deafferentiation, why something, something like mirror therapy and virtual kind of reality training may have a, a role in this. But again, it's for, not for any type of um, phantom limb pain. This may be if somebody feels like their limb is in a very clenched position, you know, which is disfiguring and kind of distressing to them. So for subsets, you know, this may be important. So let's talk about interventions, right? So at the level of the brain, so we have deep brain stimulation. Some people are trying out some repetitive trans uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, tractotomy, mirror therapy, virtual therapy, spinal cord stimulator, chordotomy, uh, dorsal root ganglion stimulator, dorsal root entry zone lesioning, cryoblation, RPNIs, we'll show really fast, and, and um, targeted muscle reinnervation, collagen, nerve wrapping, revision surgeries, right? So there's a question, and obviously, don't forget the medication, our prosthesis is a big part of this, right? 
So, uh, proposed surgical approaches for neuromodulation are spinal cord stimulator, you know, dorsal root ganglion stimulation, lower voltages, more targeted approach. They seem to be decreasing people's pain by like 50% or dropping through to four uh, points on a numerical pain scale. And peripheral nerve cuffs as well that may cause hyperexcitability in a time controlled fashion, right? And obviously, some advanced neuroprosthetic techniques I'm not going to go into in, in the interest of time because, again, the real scarring and whatnot, these are still sort of experimental. So, what happens to transected nerves? We've known from way back in the day, right? So, the end of that transected nerve, right, is going to basically have a disorganized, you know, kind of attempt at repair. And obviously, its surroundings matter, right? So, how you treat the transected nerve at the time of the original amputation is extremely important, right? So when lying, where it fetches up, where it's led to rest in a sense, you know, and how you treat it is extremely important for the development of potential neuroma or infantile limb pain. So when lying on bone or tendon, it can flatten when the side enlarges. So, you know, and people have looked at basically uh, how the uh, sprouting of new, uh, neurons, how the connective tissue looks like. Effectively, the neuroma is an attempt which is thwarted or blocked by scar tissue for the neuraxis of a divided nerve to seek a distal segment and complete nerve repair. So the regenerating neuraxis either form spirals or irregularly distributed and dispersed fibers, and, right? And, and these in turn uh, growth stimulate uh, the connective tissue to increase and continued growth. So the thing to understand is people have taken transected nerves and sometimes they would cut a neighboring vein and put them in just to provide a barrier or they would do collagen wrapping or a silicone sort of cup at the end, or as we'll see now, you know, things like per peripheral regenerative nerve interfaces, where you can fillet a little bit of muscle and cap at the newly transected nerve. And the nerve reestablishes a neurophysiologic connection, right? So it's as happy as a clam, right? So it's got a new terminus and it decreases the risk of a neuroma in a sense, a frank neuroma developing. So these, you know, to a year out, they seem to have, you know, um, it's a, it, 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 an appreciable effect, right? Not, not in a complete elimination, but an appreciable effect to phantom limb pain. So uh, obviously no symptomatic neuromas after RPNI, however, uh, up to a year out. However, you know, depends on who you do this on, right? So is it, is it the time of the primary amputation versus, you know, uh, uh, versus are you doing it later where there's maybe limited utility because central kind of sensitization has happened with wind up phenomena and what, what not. So targeted muscle reinnervation, right, is going to be uh, basically we're going to sacrifice a primarily motor nerve, right? Again, it's, it's got it's got afferent, you know, basically for um, uh, the proprioceptive, you know, and whatnot. So, and we take a primarily peripheral mixed nerve that we have transected, and we basically co-op them. Targeted muscle reinnervation again to a year out can decrease uh, the chances of you know higher odds of, uh, lo of lower peripheral limb pain and, and and phantom limb pain and residual limb pain. But it's not again it's not complete. So even if we look at the opioid prescription, you know, from a year out from pre-op to a year out, you know, so it seems to do better for some of our cancer patients. Not so much in trauma. The same rates may persist. And again, it's who you're doing it to, right? Because if you try to do even TMR, there are some people who basically, they have five patients who reported severe pain even after TMR. They have multiple limb, uh, failed limb salvage attempts, peripheral nerve C tumor as a primary pathology, history of an ischemic injury to a distal upper limb, and severe chronic pain for years. So it's one of those know your substrate, right? Who match the intervention in a timely window to, the, to, to sort of the appropriate thing. Uh, perioperative pharmacologic management, I'm going to go through this in a little bit of haste. So pre-op epidural catheters and immediate post-op continuation reduces perioperative op opioid consumption. Good evidence for that with some sort of now we're emerging to have randomized control trials. Uh, optimized pre-op epidural or intravenous patient controlled an analgesia. A again, starting 40 years and continuing 48 hours post-operatively decreased PLP at six months. Preventative role of Epidural local anesthetic with ketamine and even calcitonin decrease uh, if it's done early, right? Uh, uh, peripheral limb, uh, uh, phantom limb pain. And nerve catheters, right, have opioid sparing effects in the immediate post op. However, they don't seem to have an effect in, in uh, uh, lowering, in lowering, in being prophylactic against the ultimate phantom limb pain. And again, think about well, if it's a single intervention, let's say a block or a peripheral nerve sort of um, uh, catheter. 
well, how was the nerve treated, right? If it wasn't treated appropriately, capped at the end of, you know, at the time of primary amputation, there's processes that sort of bloom and kind of happen in a delayed time frame that, you know, so these, these, a lot of these interventions should be happening not singly, but, you know, uh, in the appropriate time frame and uh, in combination. So gabapentin, right, does not reduce long-term incidence or intensity of post-amputation pain. So it's more sort of, you know, symptomatic sort of masking, unfortunately. So uh, tricyclics, right? So no, no good evidence for the tricyclics. Then when I'm, I'm actually going to come back to this slide. Yep. I'm going to have to cut you off at this point, unfortunately, because uh, people have to get to the operating room. You've got quite a bit of good information here, and um, we can talk to Matt about uh, seeing if we can uh, get these slides, the last few slides especially, to people after the fact. But um, I really appreciate you uh, coming and speaking to our group. Uh, one thing I've learned in this process is that uh, like when I hear our pediatric colleagues say that kids aren't small adults, I think amputees aren't just um, uh, slightly different variations of adults. There's a lot that we don't understand and there's a lot we have to consider when we're dealing with our amputees. I really appreciate your uh, talk and I, I wanna thank you for joining our department and speaking today. Thank you, thank you. I want to invite people to just basically say, look, there's, there's a, we need to coordinate, right? Uh, discuss sort of cases, uh, take stock of what's happening with our patients and say, what are meaningful things to do early, right? And you know, what is temporizing for symptomatic relief and so that we don't get these wind up phenomena, central sensitization, make sure people are fitted. And we need good coordination of care throughout our, you know, uh, uh, throughout our kind of health system, right? So we're happy to be you know, tagged in uh, to, to help kind of prop patients up for good outcomes. Thank you. And for those of you who may have missed it, um, the CME code was 29034, so you can type that into the CME number. Thank you, Dr. Process. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everyone.